And thank you especially to the conference organizers, Aileen, Ben, and Jeremy, for inviting Sarah Clausen and I to have a conversation centered on her latest book, her 12th book, I believe, uh, The Russian Daughter. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next hour. And we're very honored to have the first spot on the lineup. So, Sarah Clausen, many of you will know her, but she's the author of 12 books, uh, best known as a poet. Uh, I believe your first book was 1988, Journey to Yalta, her first book of poetry, her most recent book of poetry in 2020, The Tree of Life. Uh, her 13th book will be coming out hopefully later this year or early next year from CMU Press, uh, the inaugural book in a poetry series that we're calling the Lyric Poetry Series, um, new and selected poems by our venerable Mennonite poets. Sarah will be the first one, and then John Weir and David Waltner Taves. So those will be coming out in the next little while. Sarah is also a fiction writer, The Russian Daughter. This novel, which came out this year, is her fourth book of fiction. And she's been the recipient of, of many awards. Uh, we, can, we can talk about awards, but she's a rather humble person. Perhaps I won't mention all of them, but she has certainly won uh, a number of awards for both her, her fiction and her poetry. Uh, in preparing for today, Sarah reminded me of the connection between this novel, The Russian Daughter, and this anniversary of the Mennonite migration commemorated with this conference. A central image of all this is a train, and many of you have just come off a train. Uh, that le left Quebec City and headed west towards here. Uh, so 100 years after this migration, this will be my first question for Sarah, uh, what you and I brought out the Russian daughter this year. Tell us about the ways that this novel corresponds to this historic trip 100 years ago. Well, I think there is a link. Um, my novel, I didn't think of it as a migration uh, narrative. But the main characters in my novel, uh, during the course of the, uh, the action, they have to face a question that our ancestors in the 1920s faced. And that question was, leave or stay? Are we going to leave this country, which most of them loved very much, or do we stay? So that was not, a, not an easy decision. If you look at your own family stories, there may be many stories of um, rifts in families. Some stayed, some left. Siblings were split, parents stayed or left. And so it was not an easy decision. And my characters in, um, in my novel, they have to face that decision to each individual member and it's not an easy decision for them. I would just like to add that another thing that is still ongoing in 2023, along with my novel being published and this wonderful celebration, is the fact that we still have, um, well, I guess we could refer to them as refugees coming from that area from which our ancestors came. Uh, this time they are not coming by train, but they are still arriving in our province and in our city. Um, a central image that we've been hearing a lot about today is the train. And in my novel also, there are train rides, several of them. So I want to start by reading, not from my novel, but from my um, poetry, my first poetry collection, a story, a poem about a train. Okay. I'm imagining the last train of the 1920s. So the poem is titled Train 1929. I hold my breath steady like everyone else. I want to stop rocking back and forth we are all caught in this rhythm, boxed in like cattle. I want to jump out and push. The train is slow, slow, as though there's time to stroll once more along the rows of pear trees, heavy with fruit. 
there's plenty of time for one more game of lawn croquet and afterwards a cup of tea before bed, before the doors are forced open, knives dance in the dark, riders fill the village street with death, flames pounding in my brain. My mother's screams split the long summer evening, spun like a dream across gold decades, fragile as dust. Who would have thought that we'd be rocking back and forth Scared, helpless as sheep, watching for the gate, for the star that must appear and disappear, except from old photos hauled half around the world. I will lift them out, gently, if anyone should ask, on long winter evenings when the train is a black dot in the distance, frost has shriveled our pear trees. I know that the origins of, of this book, The Russian Daughter, are with stories that were told to you by your mother, and I think I've heard you say that you weren't particularly interested in them when you were quite young, but uh, can you say something about the process of working with the stories that, that you heard from her many years ago? Yes, actually, starting with my very first book, which was The Journey to Yalta that I just read from, um, I am greatly indebted to my mother who was a storyteller. She came from this country and living in the uh, uh, interlake, in the boreal forest on a small farm, she wanted to share those stories, but she didn't really have an audience up there. I was her audience and she, I wasn't particularly interested, but um, eventually I got to, uh, I got to be smarter and realize that these stories are my heritage. They are my stories. Um, the stories about that journey to Yalta are ones that she repeated over and over again until I started listening. Many stories were repeated. However, there was one story that she told me that she told me as far as I know only once. And uh, this story was told to me when I was already an adult, and I seem to remember it as being told to me on a dark winter night, that may not be true. But she talked to me about a, a couple, actually her aunt and uncle, in a, uh, in a Mennonite village, and they were, uh, were farmers and they were prosperous, but they had no children. And the woman especially desperately wanted to have children um, and so they decided to try to create a family by means of uh, adoption. And they did that twice. Twice they adopted first one girl and then a second girl. Both of these adoptions ended badly. Um, in the story that she told me once, there was plenty of drama. There was betrayal, there was disappointment and loss, there was murder there was guilt, and there was so much going on that I thought when, uh, at the time I had finished my first novel, The Wittenbergs, I thought if I'm going to write another story, I better do it now. And so I thought of that story. It popped into my mind, and I thought this is going to be so easy. I have all the elements for a good plot. And so I began writing. But as I was writing, uh, things changed. I, I couldn't uh, maintain the story in the way that I had expected to. Um, and so, uh, to begin with, the main character was going to be Amalia Albrecht, the woman who wanted children so desperately. And I um, saw her as the main character, and I was right with her in, in telling that story that my mother had told to me. But as I kept on writing and developing the main character, the Russian daughter, Sophia, um, I got involved in, with her and she became the main character. So that changed the story completely. And now I had her as a main character 
And over the course of the uh, writing the novel, I had to change various things. And I found out that just hearing a story from someone might be an inspiration, but it wasn't the ready-made plot I had expected. And of course, I had to work with um, them within this setting and so on. So I think you were going to read a little bit from the beginning. Yes, I'm going to be reading a very short... <laughs> I'm going to read a sh very short section that will introduce to you Amalia and Isaac Albrecht, who um, are the, the, the childless couple in the village of Friedenthal. So Isaac has just come home from work and Amalia has been serving tea to some friends. And one of the guests with her was Hulda, who is the midwife of the village. And what did Hulda have to say, Isaac asks at supper. He's been out in the sun all day, his skin burned brown. Work has not exhausted him. He's young and strong. Sorry. And starved. He eats his fill of arenica and cream sauce and smoked sausage fried to perfection. He spreads plum jam on a slice of bread to eat with his coffee. Over supper, he has spoken of the wheat harvest, the heads full and heavy, the yield even greater than expected. Kolya says he wants to work with on the fields, Isaac tells his wife, who has not replied to the question. I told him no. Who would look after the sheep and the goats? Amalia, even quieter than usual, has listened, but neither rejoiced over a good crop, nor asked if Isaac knew whether Kolya, who sleeps in the hayloft, really is 12 years old, as he claims. She picks up her fork and taps the tablecloth with it, lightly, not ready yet to speak. Come, Amalia. You can't mean Hulda had nothing to say, no stories. Isaac wants to draw his wife out of herself and into the conversation. He wants to reach for her hand. Amalia stares at the fork. Hulda had information. Isaac's cup is still half full. He spreads another slice of bread with jam, waits for his wife to tell him more. A girl in Kharkov. She turns the fork in her hand. Another kitchen girl? And from Kharkov? No, no. We have Luda. What else do we need? Amalia says, I'm very satisfied with Luda, aren't you? Amalia, just tell me. Don't give it to me bit by bit as if you're feeding up a baby. He shouldn't have said it like that. He has jabbed his finger into the wound Amalia is unable to conceal. She's pregnant. What, Luda? No, Isaac, not Luda. Who then? The girl in Kharkov. Puzzled, Isaac waits for Amalia to explain, but his wife is silent, tongue-tied. He reaches for her hand and strokes it gently, patiently, until a realization dawns. The pregnant girl in Kharkov, a girl he doesn't know, has never seen or heard of, finds herself in a dilemma from which he and Amalia have the power to rescue her. Put another way, that girl in Kharkov has the solution to a problem the Albrechts have been unable to solve. When Amalia is ready to speak, she explains in a voice scarcely more than a whisper, but urgent that the girl's family has declared their home out of bounds for a child without a proper father. Someone must be found to provide a home for it. Why couldn't that be our home, Amalia says. Hulda thinks it could. Well, she didn't say it in so many words, but the look she gave me made her meaning clear. Now Isaac is the speechless one. He lets go Amalia's hand and avoids her eyes which are lit with a shimmer of hope. He looks down into his cup. Amalia rises to clear the table. A mirror hangs near the door to the bedroom and beside the mirror a framed photograph of Alexandra 
Empress of Russia. Amalia stops in front of her. She feels sorry for the handsome woman with stern, sad eyes. Alexandra is German, and the people don't like her. Amalia turns from the picture to study her own face in the mirror, brown eyes with a hint of green, waves of thick auburn hair. Every morning she brushes it, pulls it back firmly, twists it into a figure eight in the nape of her neck, and fastens it with pins. By noon, vagrant strands have escaped and form a tousled frame around her face, a face with fine features and skin and that is smoother, creamier than most village women can boast. She is younger than the, than the Tsarina and prettier, but Alexandra is the one with children. She has given the Tsar four daughters, and now they say she will give birth again. The Tsar wants a son. The country needs an heir. Thank you, Sarah. We'll just get our papers organized here. I wanted to say something about this village and get you to say a little something about this village. So Isaac and Amalia Albrecht and their friends uh, live in this, I believe, invented village of Friedenthal, but you have made it very real and it's probably based on places that, that you know about. And in the reviews that, that this novel has received so far, people have noted um, just how interesting the, the village is and the people of the village and that Sarah has really well imagined the life of a village more than 100 years ago in, in what is now Ukraine. So can you tell us a little bit about how you imagined that village into life? Um, well, first of all, I imagined it as um, a, a, a remote village, a small village, a remote village, a village as far away from um, St. Petersburg and Moscow and, uh, and also not really a part of any colony. Um, the reason, well, I, I wanted the village to be small, ordinary people, because my story of adoption was what I was concentrating on. And so it was a story of, of ordinary people. Um, and I didn't want them to be too, too troubled um, about the, uh, the, the things going on in the, in the world, the political and uh, the, the action that uh, was coming closer all the time. So, um, and I made, I, I made no effort to, um, sort of locate the village in a specific place that anybody could uh, uh, locate and identify. Uh, I guess that was partly protection for myself because um, uh, there's a, I have a little disclaimer in the book that says that I've taken liberties with locations and distances. And that's partly because of the travel that takes place in the story. Uh, where is this village really? Um, I don't really know. So uh, it, is, it is small, it is insignificant, and the, the villagers are ordinary people. I try to uh, inhabit it with the ordinary people that, uh, that would live in a typical village, like farmers, uh, the, the pastor, the, um, the uh, in help, the, the Russian people who helped in the village, the midwife, the storekeeper, and so on. I was going to skip ahead to a related question, I think, and, and perhaps mess things up a little bit. But um, in, in thinking about the relation between actual history and literature, um, I've noticed over the years that Mennonite literary writers often have to contend with readers who do that very thing, who will say, well, I've been to that village, and that's not where the church was, etc." cetera. Um, so, uh, and so I think Mennonites are particularly good at checking literature against the historical record. And um, I think there can be friction when a novelist or a poet uh, is considered to have deviated from uh, accepted or conventional histories. So have you experienced this sort of friction? And you know, how do you answer people when they say, well, that, that's not how it happened? 
Well, I've talked to many individuals and book clubs uh, concerning this novel, and everybody has been unfailingly polite and uh, probably quite reluctant to challenge. Uh, there were a couple, though, a couple of instances. Uh, somebody, a re one reader said to me, after having read the novel, did you know that uh, a central shula in Russia was generally segregated? So I, well, of course, I knew about the Machen Shula in, uh, in the Russian system, uh, that there were girls' schools, but I also, um, but I hadn't really, really known. So, and then he continued by saying, oh, but there was one, there was one that was co-ed. And so I thought, I heaved a big sigh of relief, and I thought, okay, I fit in that. <laughs> uh, the other one I thought was a very interesting and a very good question uh, posed by somebody in a book club and said, weren't the um, villages, wasn't there usually in every village a sort of a strong authority, um, a mayor, I think they called them Schulze, Schulze. Um, and didn't they sort of like to wield power sometimes? And that is quite true. And when I think of the novel, that that could well be a place where I missed an opportunity because I did not really uh, speak about a strong leadership. Maybe that fits with my modest community. I mean, there is um, um, a pastor, and he is in a way a gentle leader, but he certainly does not wield power. I'm very fond of your pastor. I, I functioned as the editor of this book as well as its publisher, and I became very fond of, of all these characters, especially the pastor. Um, while we were working together, I'm skipping around a bit again to, just to confuse Sarah. Um, when we were working together, early on I mentioned that the first manuscript that I saw did not use the word Mennonite. Um, these characters were clearly Mennonite, and, and I didn't grow up, uh, uh, I'm a Mennonite by choice, I didn't grow up Mennonite. So, um, but even I could tell that these people were clearly Mennonite, but she wasn't using the term. And so I said, you know, can you explain why? And I said, Do you, don't you think we should at least, you know, say every now and then that these are, are Mennonite people? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? I mean, I think one of my suspicions, or perhaps we even spelled that out, was that you wanted this book to be open and inclusive and not just for Mennonites about Mennonites, but can you talk a little bit about the naming of the Mennonite characters? Yes, and by the way, oh, and by the way, Sue, you are quite right in nudging me in that direction, because of course it was Mennonite, and of course they should have Mennonite names. So why was I doing that? And you're right, I wanted it to be, it, I wanted it to be universal. Um, and partly it may be because, as I say, I grew up in the, in the boreal forest in a, in a mostly um, Anglo-Saxon community, and uh, there were rumors of war coming across at us, and I was very little and very scared of war, and very aware of the fact that in my home, we spoke the language of the enemy. So, and I wanted to be Canadian. I'm wondering if it was a carryover from that. But yes, I could have, if it, in making that story of, of um, uh, adoption a, a universal story, I could have said it in Winnipeg, right? I could have said it in anywhere. But I was sort of committed to setting it in the place that, it ha that the original story that inspired me happened, and that was the village in Russia. Right. You have traveled, uh, I think, in the... 1980s or 1990s, you taught in both Lithuania and Ukraine. Was it in the 80s? Yes. Yeah. Um, so you have definitely, you know, traveled in the area where this novel is set. Um, so how important was your own experience there when you conceived of this novel? Was it really helpful or did you have to do research or? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I traveled a lot. I was very fortunate and I was on the very last heritage cruise on the Dnieper River before that ended and everything. And uh, one thing about that cruise, uh, it was already too late to include in that cruise Yalta. That was a very important uh, place for me and we couldn't go there. 
But actually, apart from seeing um, old houses and remnants of Mennonite culture, some of it very well maintained, some of it elegant, and some, a lot of it, of course, uh, um, falling down and, and wrecked. I can't say that my travel really helped me in that. I have to say, and I re keep referring to my first book, which was The Journey to Yalta. For that book, it was very important to me to see Yalta. And uh, that was my first trip, and that was when the Soviet Union was still intact. So that was important, but as far as this novel is concerned, I can't honestly say that it helped. But can I say something about uh, uh, my so-called research? Yes, <laughs> yes. All right, so, um, and I know one of, you, one of the things you mentioned was about had I read any, any books that helped. Well, of course, I have read books. Um, as far as research is concerned, um, it seems to me that right from the beginning, I have been almost like preparing for this novel. That sounds like a grandiose um, thought. But anyway, uh, growing up with my mother's stories in a Mennonite family, I went to the MBCI where we had Gerhard Lawrence, who was a storyteller, another knowledge keeper among our people. And I, I listened, we, we loved his stories and he could entertain us with them and his writings afterwards. Um, and then there were books that I read, novels, of course. We're going to be hearing Sandra Bertzel tonight. I read her wonderful novel, which covers this period. Rudy Weeb's novel was helpful, another big novel. Both of those were big novels that um, um, sort of overwhelm my little novel. Uh, there was another book that I read, and that was earlier. It was called Eine Mutter by Peter Epp, and I don't know if anybody else in this room would have ever heard of that, but you may have heard of the uh, revised, edited translation, Agatchen. So that is a fictionalized version of my grandmother's, my great-grandmother's story. And uh, scholars like Al Reimer held that up as a major Mennonite novel. And in my family, we saw it as a story of our family because the author didn't even change the names. But that it also is um, a retelling of that period. It, and it's again a big novel. So those three big novels um, were a help, but I did not in any way try to um, model my story on that because, well, everybody's vision of that is quite different. I want to talk for a moment about the what most people see as the main character of this novel, although I think that there are uh, a very compelling cast of characters, and in you, to a certain extent you can choose which character you decide is the protagonist, but the Russian daughter, Sophia, is this illegitimate baby that this Mennonite couple adopts in the early years of the 20th century, uh, Sophia. Sophia is a, a real a real character. Uh, Sophia, uh, the, the circumstances of her birth are mysterious to her and, and to us. She also has some physical challenges which are unexplained for a long time and are mysterious to her and, and to us. And I want to just ask you about the, the question of mystery because she is not a straightforward character. She's mysterious, I think, to herself and to us for a while. And I'm wondering how important that was to you as you were building this story to keep that sense of, of mystery and even suspense to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, well obviously I wasn't writing a thriller to which we usually apply the word suspense, but um, of course um, I, would, I would think I would try to, I would prefer to use the word tension. A story has to have tension and I did try to create that concerning her by, by withholding information and letting it come out 
rather slowly uh, some of the information. So um, as the story goes, as a writer, you sort of place your character in a situation, let's say up, up at top of an apple tree, and then when the person wants to come down, you toss green apples at them, make it really difficult. So I, I was concerned about uh, creating enough uh, or tossing enough uh, apples at my characters to give them something to worry about and the reader something to worry about. And, and there are a number of these. And uh, of course, growing in the background was this element of the political situation that, uh, that uh, they, the characters had to deal with. So yeah, I think uh, that's something a writer has to worry about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think at this point we're going to read a little bit on page 36, I think. I'll hold your microphone again. Okay. Oh, that's your book. Okay. This introduces uh, the Russian daughter, Sophia, who is sometimes as a child called Fia. And it's, um, she is at this point uh, going to school. Once again, trees and shrubs are exploding into color as they always do before fall gives way to winter. The splendor of gold and red stirs human hearts to gratitude and wonder. And Lirar Viba is more than willing to let his heart be stirred. When a wind from the steps comes sweeping across the schoolyard chasing fallen leaves or when swallows swoop low, he urges his students to look, to pay attention. It's important, he tells them. School is out for the day, the children gone, except for eight-year-old Fia Albrecht, that's Sophia, crouched near the gate, hugging her knees over which she had pulled her, the apron of her school uniform. Don't wait for me, just go, she told Trudel and Anna. Puzzled, her friends turned and left without her. Usually, Fia is impatient to be gone, often first to leave the school, run home along the path the children's feet, feet have made. When she arrives home, old Gogol will leap up at her, determined to prevent her from dashing into the house. Usually, she kicks him aside, but other times she humors him with her attention. Today she sits alone in the school grounds, convinced she is a small and insignificant bump on the landscape. Lira Viba believes in storytelling, a tool he pulls out when tensions arrive at the point of snapping, or boredom is sucking the life out of his charges, or end of day restlessness makes them hard to control. He likes to launch slowly into a story, spinning the facts and characters and events from an a magic web of adventure. He entrances his students in the world of story. Today he ended with a story about an amazing flying machine invented by the brothers in America. Such adventures are far beyond anything the children of Friedenthal can imagine. But as Lira Weeb spoke, Fia tried to picture human beings flying like birds through the air reaching the clouds, disappearing inside them. Impossible, she thought, but right now she wishes it were. She would gladly climb into a kitty hawk, if that's what they were, they were called, and fly away from school, from Friedenthal. Thea hugs her knees more tightly and waves and wavers between trying not to relive what happened after school and attempting to reshape it into something that makes sense. Really, it wasn't much, a handful of words flung in her face, but those words have succeeded in leeching the afternoon of its color, leaving everything indistinctly gray, unfriendly. She was standing just outside the school waiting for Trudel and locate, to locate Anna, so the three of them could run home together when two boys came racing out of nowhere and veered sharply in her direction. Not by chance, they were deliberate. Hey, little Fia, Yash said when he stopped in front of her. His voice had its usual scornful tone. Before she could muster a sharp retort, Petya said, 
What does someone so little come, where does someone so little come from? Not from here. Your parents are not your parents. The boys ran laughing out of the schoolyard. Your parents are not your parents. The words make no sense. It should be easy to blot out Petya's stupid words. Simply erase them the way she erases her slate after doing a sum. They are just one more cruel barb, the kind she has learned to expect and, is and determined to defend herself against or ignore. In the past few decades, the Mennonite literary community has garnered a lot of attention. Why do you think that Mennonite writing seems to be so robust and, and vibrant? Well, it was all started, I guess, by Rudy Weeb, and that was then followed by um, writers like Patrick Friesen, Armin Weeb, Di Brandt. Um, I think one reason is because, well, there are so many of us, and um, uh, they haven't, like in, in Russia, there wasn't a great Mennonite literature. But why is it so robust? That's a hard question to answer. I think because um, there is a robust literary community. Um, Mennonites had reached a stage of, you know, they having reached a certain level of prosperity. There was time to uh, pay attention to arts and literature. And uh, they were writing their stories and they certainly had stories to tell. So... Um, when you were starting out, was there a suspicion of literary writing that it was perhaps, you know, in the Mennonite community considered to be frivolous and an extra that perhaps people shouldn't be bothered with? I can't say that I remember too much of that. I think there was, you're probably right that there was, but there was also a, a, an interest, and I always felt I had support in my case, and I know there were, were, were um, voices critical of some of the earlier Mennonite writing and, and suspicion, and certainly that began with Rudy Weeb. You are both a, a poet and a fiction writer, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm wondering where your loyalties lie on any particular day. How, how does a poet and a fiction writer decide that this is a poem and, and that is a short story or a novel? How do you, can you sort yourself out quite easily or is it a little more complicated than that? Um, a poem uh, comes more easily to me than, than a story. A uh, poem comes with a, a phrase or an image or something that I've just read or heard or talked about uh, or, the, or something on the news. Um, and so a poem is easy for me to start, not always that easy to finish. As far as um, um, fiction is concerned, well, in, in case of my, I only have two novels, it, has, it required a very deliberate um, effort on my part to say, well, I, I want to write a novel. I've written all these books of poetry. Maybe I should try this. I had already written short fiction, and that seems like a long time ago, and I haven't got much of a memory of um, uh, how they were written. I did flip through my short stories the other day, and flipping back to your question of why was I reluctant to um, be Mennonite in my writing or something, I noticed that very few of my short fiction stories in, uh, in either of the two books were Mennonite stories. And yet, when I looked over them, I, I could recognize, yeah, this was based on something Mennonite and I made it non-Mennonite. So. so much of Mennonite fiction in particular um, is entwined with history. If people ask you about the writing of historical fiction um, or figuring out how to just write their own family stories, which Mennonites are very fond of doing, um, 
If people ask you for writing advice, especially how to use history within their writing, do you have particular mm -hmm. pieces of advice or models that you look to? Well, first of all, um, I don't really consider myself an historical fiction writer. Uh, when I was reading this, no writing this novel, I never thought I'm writing an historical fiction. I was a little surprised when it's always being named as historical fiction. Uh, what is historical fiction? In my mind, I thought it was, um, well, certainly the setting, the time of the story and where it takes place, what's going on in the world. But such a historical fiction should have a major historical character um, taking an active part in the action of the narrative. This doesn't happen in my novel. The only character who's actually named is... Uh, the last empress of Russia, and she is only a picture on the wall. So I am not someone um, that people should turn to for advice on writing historical fiction, because I always thought I was just writing ordinary literary fiction, which deals with relationships and uh, feelings and uh, so on. Um, but I think I could give one bit of um, advice that is certainly solid, and that would be read lots of good historical fiction. One of the things that this novel is obviously about is about family and how family, the very definition of family is constantly under, under revision. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is no such thing as an ideal family. Uh, I think Amelia Albrecht at the beginning of the novel thinks you know, add a baby to this family, we'll have an mm -hmm. ideal family. Um, but then they end up with this very challenging Russian daughter to raise. Um, and so they undergo a fair bit of conflict within the family. Um, so did you deliberately set out to write about these sort of difficult but ultimately loving family relationships or did it just sort of happen as you were writing the book? Well, as I said, it was going to be about adoption, this novel. But then it did turn into a story of how is a family created. And uh, in this novel, there are quite a number of mothers. And Amalia is trying to create a family, and, and Isaac. And the, at certain points, they feel very helpless about it because they hadn't anticipated all these different personalities in their, in their family. And I'm thinking of the um, uh, brother and sister Klein, who are also childless, and they um, opened their home, and that created a little temporary family for our main character. So, and, and that was a kind of a reprieve, where there, in that particular home, I don't think there really were tensions. But uh, um, right at the beginning, there's a tension in a family, a mother comes to visit um, Amalia, this is before Amalia is adopted, and this uh, woman is concerned about her family because there's an upcoming wedding and she's unhappy about it. So, yeah, I think it sort of built and it just happened and uh, by using ordinary village events and I think Mennonite ideas of, uh, um, you know, they take in families or the whatever, so. Yes, and, and the characters, the, the children that end up in the Albrecht family, Hannah and Boris as well, they are all very individual. Uh, Sarah has one more little bit of reading to do in a moment, but before that, um, we'd be happy to take any questions or comments from the audience, and I'll repeat them so that uh, Sarah can be sure to hear them. Um, so if there are any questions, um, we could take a couple of minutes, and then we'll have a final reading. I'm going to ask one more of my questions then. You've lived in Manitoba your entire life, and to a certain extent, as we can see by the people gathered here, Manitoba feels very central in the discussion of, of Mennonite culture. Um, you've lived, yeah, you've lived here always. How do you feel about the Manitoba cultural scene? I've only lived here for a little over 20 years, and I find it to be a very 
tight-knit cultural community. Um, do you ever wish you'd been somewhere else? Or are you quite happy being here in this, <laughs> in this particular place? I've been quite happy in being here. And uh, no, I've never actually wanted to be somewhere else. And yes, the cultural scene is, is interesting. At the time when I started writing, there was a great deal of attention given to Mennonite writing. And that was fortunate for me, because I could sort of you know ride on the coattails of others. Um, and it drew attention to my writing, too. Um, ethnic writing. But since then, uh, the, the, the writing scene has exploded, and Mennonite writing is part of the broad, broader spectrum of ethnic writing, Ukrainian writing, indigenous writing, black writing, queer writing. So it is um, an expanding place. And, and content to be there, not likely, not likely to move away. So before we close our conversation, I think uh, you'd like to read a little bit more, and I'll hold your microphone for you. And this is not, not from the end of the book, but, but farther on in the book, I believe. Uh, what, uh, 255? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, it is the end of the book, uh, just a short scene from the end. The main character is coming back to the vid village of Friedenthal after having been away, and she is um, um, finding a, a vi the village of Friedenthal very different from the way she left it. Yeah. Leaving the train at Naumanka, Sophia begins walking. She moves at a moderate pace and with purpose. Gates at the picket fence, oh, sorry. When they reach the Willow Bluff, she asks the driver to stop. She gets down, waves the driver on. She can hear the cheerful sound of water in the brook, but does not go near it. The sun is warm on her back. She takes off her shawl. Above her, the sky is a pale blue dotted here and there with clumps of cloud. Sophia looks up, finds it beautiful, and wants to linger. But days are short. She continues walking. Gates in the picket fences swing on their hinges. Already, bricks have been broken away from the corners of houses, some of which are smoke-blackened around the windows, and otherwise empty yards, stray goats and hens forage for food. At the Albrecht home, she stops. The gate is closed. Her heart pounds as she opens it and walks through. The bench beside the door is gone. She shrinks from entering the house but forces herself to open the door. The kitchen is empty. She has to imagine the table where her family ate together. On the wall near the bedroom is the faded space once occupied by the last Empress of Russia. Beside it, another faded space where once an ornately framed mirror reflected an angry face. The sleep bench is gone from the living room. It seems to her that only dust and debris furnish her old home. She walks through the door that leads to the barn where all stalls and troughs are empty. The ladder to the loft has two broken rungs, but she climbs up anyway. Light seeps through the cracks between broken boards. The smell of moldering hay greets her and the rustling of rodents. This is where Kolya slept before he claimed the shed behind the barn. Breathing hard from the climb, Sophia puts down her parcel. She ignores the rustling, lies down in the hay, closes her eyes. She has not yet accomplished what she has come to do, but already she is exhausted and before long falls asleep. She dreams. She dreams that she is sitting in the schoolhouse on a Sunday morning with Trudel and Anna. The congregation is singing. There is a land that is fairer than day, and by faith, we can see it afar. There are many verses, and all of them are sung. Sophia believes that the song is about America, the distant country Lyra Reeb likes to describe for his pupils. When she whispers this idea to her friends, they laugh. 
No, no, it's not America. What then? It's heaven, you silly goose. They point surreptitiously up to the ceiling and stifle their giggles. She does not believe them. Why should their understanding of the song be right and not hers? Pastor Langer tries to speak the benediction. He is gaunt and his face ashen. Go in peace, he says. And after a pause, he adds, go with God. Sophia wakes with a start. Pavel, she must hurry. She takes the package, climbs down from the loft, and steps into the light of day. Trees in the orchard look dead. The ground is strewn with rotting apples. Well, I will leave the rest of the story to those of you who will read it, I hope. Um, I want to thank you all for your presence while Sarah and I talk about the creation of this novel, The Russian Daughter. And, uh, and especially, I would like, you to, like to thank Sarah Claussen. So let's uh, thank Sarah for her novel. <laughs> <laughs>